and welcome to the latest edition of Doorstep History. Coming once again from the Coffin Works in Birmingham's Jewellery Quarter. Once again, plenty of stories from across the West Midlands. First, here's Tom. Now the Stone Age is something that people won't remember for obvious reasons, but out in the wilds of Shropshire there's a group that's showing people just what life was like back in that time, and we went to find out a little bit more. If you think of the Stone Age, you may well think of cave paintings, strangely clothed men and spears. But now the Stone Age is being taught in schools as part of the national curriculum and there is a new emphasis on historical accuracy and the need to make it interesting to young pupils. One group, Out Back to Basics, has taken the bison by the horns, so to speak, and encourages you to put the modern world behind you and to step into the past. My partner and I had been teaching bushcraft for quite some time. We're always into the outdoor sort of skills. Um, and we didn't really want to teach from books anymore. We wanted to teach from our own experience. Um, so we found a school um, in America that taught these skills and offered the, the whole wilderness immersion at the end. And that for us was about us testing our skills became interested in the sort of primitive skill side of things, um, realised how important it was for us and therefore wanted to pass on the message, especially to the younger generation, getting them involved in nature, respecting nature, using nature and using it as a tool really to learn about their natural heritage, you know, where people have come from, where we've come from. Um, and in doing so that makes them sort of respect their natural environment. And for some of them it's the first time they've ever been outside, so it's wonderful to connect all of the dots really. So how do we know anything about the Stone Age? Because I'm not really a cave woman, am I? Mesolithic woman! Now, Mesolithic people, a little bit different. Paleolithic, pale, old. Paleo, got it? Middle, ma? Mesolithic. Last one, new age, na? Neolithic, absolutely brilliant. Well done, guys. Okay, so can you take off your outfit? It's quite traditional for a cave woman, I guess, for a, um, yes. a primitive person. So my dress, it's an all-in-one piece. It's probably made out of about four different deer hides, all put together. It's brain tanned, so it's actually tanned using the brain of the animal. We don't want to waste anything, do we? No. Um, so that probably took about two weeks worth of making the leather, and then yeah. about one week of actually making the dress and then traditionally I had moccasins on that's what I spent my Stone Age time out wearing yeah. which isn't very good for an English woodland now is it because it gets too muddy and wet so unfortunately I had to buy these from a proper shop don't tell anybody okay. my jacket that's all made from rabbit skin and we ate all the rabbits so that's fine to use isn't it yeah. and then I've got another waistcoat on here to keep me nice and warm and that's also rabbit skin all woven around a natural twine yeah. and then I do it, unfortunately it's in the other in the other roundhouse but I do have a big buckskin jacket as well with a big furry hood to keep me nice and warm yeah. and then when I lived out I also had a felted waistcoat on and a felted hat and a felted blanket and I was nice and snugly warm topic like the Stone Age, it's really difficult, isn't it, for, even for teachers to teach it to the to kids? Yeah. So, obviously something like this, it's a godsend for schools, isn't it? Yeah, I think that there's a quite a lot of information out there, but everything's different. It's so fragmented because, of course, it's all just puzzle pieces that people have put together. Um, and our sort of feeling behind it was is if we could bring it alive, if we could make it 3D, if we could make it so that the kids could feel it, touch it, smell it, that they might, might start to have an understanding of it, rather than just going to a museum, reading a book. You know, I'm there in front of you standing in clothes that I made to live outside like essentially a cave woman or primitively at the very least um, so we have become quite busy since it came into the school curriculum we came back to the UK and tried to offer it and schools thought it seems great but doesn't connect and then suddenly it came into the national curriculum um, and schools are really really wanting to, to come to us really schools can get involved by uh, via the website which is www.outback two basics with the number two dot co dot uk um, or by email uh, and that's info at outback two basics dot co dot uk now the thing about this sort of shelter is is that they probably wouldn't have lived in a shelter like this but they probably would have stayed in a shelter like this when they went out on a hunting trip John you right? yeah. I can get one to oh. okay. Here, here, here. Down, 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 down,
Finally, we're out. Good. 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 This, this, um, have a look at the lab. This, this lab, would, um, this lab is going to be really cool when we're going yeah. to fix this. Yeah. yeah. We're going to fix um. The it's going to be a lab. It's, it's going, going to, to be, be so a, awesome. It's going to be a. It's going to be a what, cave. Why don't we have a look at the lab and see what it looks like? People used to bear, um, used to live in these barrels instead of caves. Some of them did. Yeah. yeah. And the new, what do they use these for then? They they use these to make shows. So so at, at the morning they can hunt their own food. So they take the skin off and um, eat them. Right. So when it's like when it's hunting, so like they didn't used to have a bath or anything. So. So like when, for example, let's just say there was a deer and they smelled lemon juice, it will run away. And then if like, and then if the deer smells like, like something stinky, it'll think it's another deer. Around the corner here. Um, the shelter is used for people who, if it's raining, they could use this den here to make um so they could go under shelter um the pe people ate nuts and berries and they created their own weapons called speeds and bowls people use sticks, sticks to make, make and, and dance when, when they, they go camping camp camp for hunting and when you use bones when you break them apart you can get some sharp things and, and you can and kill animals and they also use animal skin for clothes so when they find the animals, animals um, they will sew up the skin to make clothes and eat the meat. We built the shelter out of sticks and um, leaves, leaves and it helps us to the rain not to, to keep warm and dry. dry and, and keeps us camouflaged. And it keeps us safe at night. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a great place to sleep. Yeah. Because it's all yeah, so nice. It's all like nice. Stop moving sticks. Oops, like no. Can we all feel the rain coming? Yeah! Not yet! Yeah. Not yet! <laughs> no, I can't feel it! I can't! I can't. <laughs> Ma large I hole there, isn't it. there, eh? Large hole here! Yeah. I can't feel any rain! I didn't get to feel any rain! Would you like to? Yeah! This really helps indicate the importance of what was the word about living together with people, communities. communities. And that's one of the main reasons why people survive. But when he started working with people, he could hunt better, he could live better, he could survive better. We could all so it would have been used to make holes in things. I'm going to pass around this one. This is a um, deer leg. It's a now a knife, oh, and I have I used that to skin fish and things like that. Oh. Axe heads made from agate stone. Ooh. This is a spearhead. But again, I reckon that they would have had to have been right up close to that animal to be able to get it. But these are fish spears. Oh, so fish. they would have been attached onto a long stick, stood over a clear lake, looked for a fish. Poof, can you imagine? Oh yeah. Yeah. And those would have been sharpened. Would have worn animal skins. What kind of animals? Um, foxes. Maybe foxes. Saber tooth. Saber tooth tigers. Hyenas. Hyenas. Maybe. It depends what country we were in, right? And our animals were a lot different back then. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to pass around some of my hides, some of my animal skins. Would you like to try an ant? No. Oh, hey, Does anybody want to? No. Me, 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 me. Oh, oh, no. Do you really? Yeah. Actually wants to try. I do have some mealworms and crickets if you prefer. Would you like an ant or would you prefer a uh, worm? Ew! A worm? <gasps> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, they're a little bit bigger but they're really crunchy. Oh, yeah. They're called edible okay, creatures. Well done. An idea of what these things were like. They're all deer. Any idea? We have them in our woodlands. It's not a squirrel, you have it as a pet. Rabbit. Rabbit, well done. This one, a bit stinky. And I thought to myself, I'll take that home and wash it for the kids. No, because I want you to smell what it would have been like to be in like a cave fan. It's warm and 
it's 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 really good material for people who lived in the stone age you're watching doorstep history here from the coffin works now if you or any relatives have any stories that you'd wish to share with us here at doorstep history then don't hesitate to get in contact with us on twitter at big center tv facebook at big center tv or you can email us at history at big center dot tv So we're back at the Coffin Works where this series of doorstep history is being filmed from and we're standing in the exhibition space where a very quirky exhibition, Crazy Coffins, is taking place and it's on until the 23rd of October so you can come down and see it before that date. But Karen, who's been involved in the project, is here to tell us a little bit more. So Karen, this is one of the crazy coffins. Can you really be buried in this? Yes, you can. It's very good. It's a very apt coffin for the local area because of all the canals around here. And stuff uh, many years ago, most of the merchandise used to be transferred via barge. So it's perfect. So we've got the canal out there. Canal out there, coffin barge in here. There you go. Who knew? So Karen, as part of this project, you had to design your own coffin, didn't you? So yeah. tell us more. Yes, I did. I had to. Uh, this was my coffin, and this was I chose green for my Irish heritage and fairies because I like fairies, and you know I'm away with them sometimes, so that's <laughs> really good. And flowers and things. So yeah, this is why. But everybody really enjoyed it. Now back to Tom in the courtyard. In an earlier programme we featured St Philip's Cathedral in Cornwall Row which is celebrating its 300th anniversary this year. Yeah but it's not only the building itself that's being renovated because we discovered that some of the tombs in the cathedral grounds are also being given a much needed renovation. It's not just the cathedral that's being renovated because lots of work is also taking place in the cathedral grounds. And behind me is the tomb of a well-known industrialist and his family have paid for this tomb to be renovated. The work is being done by a lady called Veronica. What I'm doing on the tomb is I'm removing the uh, biological growth and cleaning the surface and I'm also consolidating the fragile, frail uh, stone substrate and filling the missing stone. The tomb is made out of sandstone mainly. The plaques are made of white marble and black marble, marble which are engraved and gilded. The sandstone is extremely fragile and flaking off and because of that it requires a very delicate and gradual conservation treatment. Uh, the treatment is taking several weeks because the process um, has to be undertaken in stages to ensure that the most sympathetic procedures are employed. What we can see here is a sandstone which is badly deteriorated. You can see how much the sandstone is delaminating and in certain areas it has already been lost. During the rain the soil is transferred onto the stone surface and the salt which is contained within the soil is then transferred and moves into the stone substrate. During the drying and freezing cycles, the salt crystallizes and um, contributes towards the delamination of the stone. As you can see here, as we can see here, a lot of stone has perished away, but there are still sections like this one where the sandstone is just about hanging on. And what we will be doing is we will be consolidating these areas to make sure that this original st stone substrate is preserved and stays in its own place. And after we consolidate all these areas and make them structurally stronger, we will then do fills to make sure that no further loss of stone occurs. It is good that the Bellis family is having the tomb 
conserved because it is often the case that um, tombs perish away um, and it's not possible to save them when the deterioration reaches a point of no return. Luckily, in this instance, the Bellis tomb has been restored and looks fantastic. The most famous member of the family, however, is not buried here. He was George Bellis, who in 1862 set up an engineering company which became the world-famous Bellis and Morecambe, making steam compressors. Although absorbed by numerous amalgamations since the Ladywood factory closed in 1992, it still operates from Redditch. Now next year sees the centenary of the Battle of the Somme. And in the build up to that, we'll be looking at various aspects of World War I. I've recently been to a church service in Edgbaston where a memorial and a peace garden was commemorated Families from the parish of St George's in Edgbaston gathered to remember three men who were killed during the First World War. Raymond Lodge, Joe Belcher and John Chamberlain. Raymond Lodge, who was 25, was the son of the Birmingham University man Sir Oliver Lodge and he lived opposite the church in the now demolished Merrymount House. Joseph Belcher from Windsor Green was a bugler stretcher bearer and in civilian life worked at m and Brewery at Cape Hill. John Chamberlain's uncle was Mayor and Birmingham MP Joseph Chamberlain. With a very strong spirit of service and indeed patriotic fervour pro propelled very many young men into the ranks how suddenly and gravely the world changed for young men like them when the journey was made across the channel. And the Ypres salient, as it was known, was a stretch of the front in the form of a bulge of land projecting into enemy territory, and this made this particularly dangerous. Although John survived the early fighting at Ypres in 1915, it is salutary to observe that Raymond, John and Joseph most probably served alongside each other, and even in close proximity in the battles at Ypres in 1915. The church already contains a plaque in memory of Raymond Lodge and many of his descendants were there for the service. Remember the Lord, Raymond Lodge, the loved son of Oliver and Mary. May his memory be treasured and may the souls of all who loved him rest with him in your peace. Jesus, remember us when you come into your kingdom. Joe's relative, Terry Aldridge, laid a wreath at the main World War I memorial, which contains over 40 names. Remember, Lord, those of our community of Edgbaston and Ladywood, who gave their lives in the service of the nation and the cause of peace in the First World War. Peace Garden was commemorated in the church grounds. We decided that we were to commemorate peace as well as war. So this is our special Peace Garden. The centerpiece is a magnolia which was collected by, um, not this particular one, the species by China Wilson, the famous plant collector, who was married in the church and lived locally. We're remembering particularly those of the area who died in the First World War and marking it with a plaque. It's a fantastic thing to remember three, you know, three guys coming from different walks of life middle class, working class, whatever, they were all bound together as one during, in, the, in the war, you know, sort of uh, death makes no distinctions to class. I remember Lodge. Raymond was my great great uncle. My name is Nick. Raymond was my great great uncle. He died in the war? Because of his wounds. Well, he was very important to our family and we care about him. So. And he was a patriot and he, and he um, helped us save our country. Here's another postcard from the past. Do you recognise where this is? 
I didn't first of all, but now I can see that it is New Street. But look, look at the bus, we've got a special bus here, and that could be that very open <laughs> back bus there, look coming down yeah. New Street. And of course you can't get buses going down New Street now. No you can't. And people talk about how Birmingham's such an ugly city in parts, but if you looked at that you wouldn't say it was, would you? No, that was that a was fantastic was building, but of course, what did Birmingham do? Knock it down. Around. Yeah. And that's part of the paved area leading up to the Fluji and the Jacuzzi now, isn't it? So this was sent in September 1970. And it says five piece of pre decimal. Well, so we've talked about the buildings changed, but something hasn't changed though. We'll look at what it says about the weather. Right. Enjoying a few days here with my family. I had a miserable journey. It rained all the way. So surprise, told surprise. Some things don't <laughs> change. And that's another postcard from the past. Well, that's it for this week's episode of Doorstep History. Goodbye and thanks for watching.